City University Television. In association with the Center for Advanced Study in Theater Arts. And the Harold Plurman Endowment. Presents Spotlight. Welcome to Spotlight. I'm Ed Wilson, and my guest today is one of America's most original and entertaining, as well as most provocative playwrights, John Guare. John, welcome. Thank you, Ed. John, I once heard you say that you got your first playwriting lesson looking at the back of albums of Broadway musicals. Well, it's that's true. It was a great lesson. I mean, just breaking down the structure that are, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, that's... Well, now, tell, but I mean, why, tell, what, what was the lesson? And how, well, the it, lesson it, it, was... First of all, did, did you, you did say that. Oh, absolutely. You? What struck me was, you'd read them over and over, and you'd listen and read them over, and the thing that suddenly, that dawned on me was that every show, I think except for Showboat, but every <laughs> show... The second number was always what I want. All I want is a room somewhere. Uh, even the boyfriend, we've, you know, I want what we, <coughs> all, I, <coughs> all I want is a room in Bloomsbury. You know, and it was all, no matter how silly or pretentious the musical was, the second song always seemed to be, the first or second song always seemed to be the want song whether it was West Side Story, that something's coming. I don't know what I want, but I want something. And I was, I was, I mean, I was, this was, I was 15, 16, you know, I mean, and so it was a great revelation to, to make those connections and say, oh, I see, that's the same as those three sisters. I want to go to Moscow. I mean, it just seemed to be an extraordinarily stupid revelation. But, uh, but, but it was that your sort of first insight into dramatic structure then, I presume? I would think so, yes. And I realized that reading those libretto, that the high points of the, the musical, you know, that they would break, <coughs> that the, backs, the back of the cover would break down the structure. What you were reading was not a synopsis, but actually the structure that got you from high point to high point to high point. And including the setbacks and the complications. That's and right. Everything. And then at the same time, then reading things like Hitchcock saying that he never made a movie until he had a certain number of high points, a certain number of bumps. And then we had enough bumps, he'd sort of find the best way to tie them together and then proceed with the film. And oh, I see, it suddenly draw, dawned on me that the, the shocks in a Hitchcock picture were analogous to the songs in a musical. And so, bit by bit, you sort of stumble your way through structure. Have you been fascinated with structure all these years ever since then? Because I, I know you wrote the introduction to a volume called From Ibsen's Workshop yeah. about Hendrik Ibsen, which yeah. is, and I presume you were part of the concern there was with, with structure. Well, I've always been fascinated by it. I mean, I, when I teach playwriting, I mean, I, the pl I love to, te to use the plays of, uh, for example, Somerset Maugham. I mean, The Circle is currently running. I love those kind of plays in which the machinery is so obvious that you can literally look at it like some sort of erector set. I had a great experience once. I mean, I've had, <laughs> it's not my greatest experience, <laughs> but I read Michael Myers' biography of, of Ibsen when it came out, and I stopped and read each play in... As he mentioned it? As he mentioned it. And it's a, the most, that was one of the greatest educational experiences I've ever had because what you saw was you saw uh, these pompous pretentious verse plays and then you saw him adapting the boulevard structure of Scribe and so I do and I'd go back and I would find th then I go and hunt and find these out-of-print plays by Scribe and Sardou and read those plays and to see how and of course that's where the term well-made play came absolutely. in with Scribe and Sardou yes and so then I would go and I would read, oh, I see Pillars of Society building into ha how growing into Dollhouse and, and Wild Duck and saying, oh, I see how he takes the structure and the way that, for example, Chekhov takes the poetry to gracefully to sort of bleed from one moment to another, that Ibsen, in a sense, like O'Neill, is not, has no language. Language is not the extraordinary, it's not the great gift. It's the way that the machinery creates this energy that moves 
like these Norwegian ice flows <laughs> down the fjords of our lives. And uh, yes, that w and then seeing as one got, got, as Ibsen blessedly having a long life, seeing the way then that he began to break up that structure until we get to the last play when we dead awaken when they literally are climbing up the mountaintop right. and it's all crumbling away. So it's a great experience to see going from verse drama to a well-made play to see that sort of come to a crescendo and then... And of course one of those final plays is about an architect as well. That's right. Yeah. No, it's not an architect, it's about a builder. It's, builder, about, a, it's right. about a draftsman. Yeah, I mean, it's, yes. about a, it's about an engineer, it's right. about a, a constructor, it's not an architect. It's about someone who builds rather than someone who designs and someone who creates, not Ayn Rand. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit, just since we mentioned musical albums before we move on to plays. Yeah. You've always been fascinated with musicals. I well, mean, sure, you put songs it? into the House of Blue Leaves, yeah. which you wrote yourself. Well, they were from a musical that I had written really? when I was in college. And Where did you go to college? I went to Georgetown in Washington, D.C. And uh, But you grew up in... In New York. In New York. Yeah. Yes. Born in born in New York. Conceived. Born. <laughs> drug up here. And so you always went the theater to me is going to see Annie get your gun or Where's Charlie or you know, that the theater for a long time was that event of going to the musical theater. I can even remember the first time we were going to go to a straight play, I couldn't imagine how it would begin. I mean, would they just tell it start an with an, an overture? Yes, I still haven't figured. That well, out. now, have you? Because you did the musical adaptation of Two Gentlemen of yes, Verona, I did. which yeah. ran on Broadway as well as off Broadway. Yeah. Have you been tempted to try another out-and-out -out musical adaptation like that? Uh, no, at a certain point after that, you know, we won the Tony for the best musical and you know, for the Tony for the best libretto and all, and I was offered a lot of musicals, I, you know, was suddenly, and I realized I, want, I had to make a choice. What did I want to do? And I was a playwright, for, for better or for worse. I mean, I wanted to, uh, that's what I did. And I, I've worked, I've, uh, I worked, it, well, this is too strange, I mean, odd, odd story, but I had worked on a, a, a music, a, an adaptation of a Breck play with uh, Leonard Bernstein and Steve Sondheim, directed by Jerry Robbins, and we started it in 1968 and took an 18-year hiatus, <laughs> and then picked up in 1986. Oh, really? And we worked on it for about six months at Lincoln Center and did five performances of it. And uh, we could, for various reasons, we could continue, but for various reasons, you have enough. A, 18 you have years, a, I felt was enough. Yes. <laughs> so uh, now, just before one other thing about you mentioned, you said I'm a playwright. And, of course, your work bears that out, but I just have to mention, ask at this point, because you have done some film work. You wrote the, screen, Every ten years. You wrote the screenplay for Atlantic City, ten which, of course, ago. was beautifully received uh -huh. and uh, a marvelous film. But you were not tempted to continue, because you must have had offers after Atlantic City in terms of screenwriting. Yes. But you decided to not go down that path as well as the musical theater path. I mean, but that, the answer to that is you did decide not, not to go in that direction, but to stay with the theater. Well, I mean, I worked, uh, I mean, I, I was going to do a film with Louis Malle, and right before we were going to start, our star died. And so that sort of put a kibosh on it. But luckily, uh, a year, about a year and a half ago, I got the rights back to that material. Oh, yeah. And so I was, like, getting it. And, and I've made it into a play that we did at Yale in the spring. I'm still working on it. It's called Moon Over Miami. But I approached that as a play. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I worked on a play in 1970. I worked on Milos Forman's first American movie called Taking Off. And then in 1980. So now it's 1990. Maybe it's time again. So I just handed, yes, yeah, so maybe I, I just handed in a, a screenplay. I just finished a screenplay on Friday. Uh, and I hope... It might be a movie. I hope they do it, yes, yes, because, yes, it would be nice. But now, coming now to the theater, which, of course, has been, the, and I'm talking now about, not about musicals, which yeah. you've been in love with always, but where you've spent so much time writing, The House of Blue Leaves, which I presume is your most frequently produced play, or is that... King Lear. King Lear. Is more, and then, then House of Blue then Leaves. Then House of Blue Leaves. I wanted to ask you about an experience that you must have had with... Uh, the House of Blue Leaves. It, w and it, was, it was first produced, I think, in 1971. Or That's right. 
Then it was, it's been done subsequently, and of course it had a yeah. very successful, successful revival at Lincoln at Center. Lincoln Center. Uh, I mean, tremendously successful uh, in the late, in the mid to late 80s. When it went with 80, uh, 86. 86. But in the meantime, uh, it's been produced along the way, and you must have had some interesting experiences. I think it was was it done in Miami by a, a Latino, a, a Latino, it's all Latino cast. Yeah. What was that experience like? Well, I'll tell you, it was no different than because it's about <coughs> Irish. Catholics. Yeah, but I mean, I saw the play was done in, in Paris very successfully, called Un Papa New York, a Pope in New York, because Maison de Foy Bleu was to uh, Tennessee Williams, they said. But uh, no, it was like when you go, when you see the play in, in, in France, which I did, you don't say, oh, look at those French people. Play. You're just saying it is where they're playing. I mean, it's just, I mean, and, and literally, Miami is another country. And I mean, what is Joan Didion's is that Miami is like the, the, the capital city of some mythical <laughs> Latin American <laughs> country, yes. And it wasn't any way odd or, you know, you didn't say, oh, look at those funny Hispanic people doing my play. You were in, they captured for themselves the genius and, that, I mean, the spirit of the place. And it, and it was successful. Oh, it was wonderful because it was about that place. I know a friend of mine once said that he went to, to Turkey, to Istanbul, and he went to the, the theater there to see what was playing. And he stood in the back of the theater saying, I wonder what this play is. And he realized... It was horror. It was House of Blue Leaves he was watching in, in Turkish. And it's so, you know, I, I didn't come all this way. To, to yes, I came to see some, you know, not to see Queen's some Boulevard. Uh, that's right. But it was work. a Turkish, I mean, that's the great thing about the theater is, is that you don't say, oh, how will they do, how will they do Chekhov with American people? How will they do Chekhov with British people? I mean, they just... No, it's a... Uh... The, the, but one, uh, one experience you must have had that was odd, because in the play, uh, it's the day that the Pope uh -huh. comes to New York. Yep. And you did that before the Pope had ever come to New York. Is that what... No, no, no. It was, I happened to be, for varying, the day that I got to Rome in 1966, Right. I looked at the papers, and there was the Pope on Queens Boulevard. Right. It was the first time he'd left in... 10,000 right, years, go, yes. and he came to the UN to write about peace. When I got to, I was hitchhiking around, I ended up in Cairo, and all this mail came, and my parents wrote me letters saying, maybe I thought I was seeing something, being headed towards the Sudan, but they had a much better time, and they sent me all the clippings about what that day was, and I think if I had been, and I started writing the play in Egypt, and I think that I, I had been in America and had seen the Pope actually come down Queens Boulevard or just been in Manhattan, I would have you just said, might not have forget it. it. But because it. I was there in Egypt and had all this information about it, and th through my parents' eyes this day, I said, oh, I see. And I start, the play literally started with that letter. But there, there was an experience subsequently in which the, uh, there was an attempt made on the Pope's well, life yes. about the same time the play was being produced somewhere. No, no, well, up at Stockbridge, and I was, I had come out of a drama school meeting in, in about 19, the early 80s, and I saw going around the, the Times Square flashing lights, you know, the, the, the news Pope had been, the news that the Pope had been shot, and, and oh, and the, the depths of my heart, the, the, the charity of my heart, I said, what will that do to my play? And... I knew that it was playing up at Stockbridge at that time, up in the Berkshires, and I went up to see it. And strangely, the entire response to the play was different. I mean, suddenly, I mean, people had appreciated the play, but it was always in some sort of, oh, how do you think of these kooky things? Oh, About people, an attempt being made on the uh, Yes, because the, the plot of the play is, is that the boy in the play wants to, to be known, to be famous, it says, I know what I'll do, I'll, I'll blow up the Pope. And, uh, and uh, when that happened, when that event happened, suddenly it, it was as if some mirror had shattered, and we in the audience were all pushed onto the same side as the play. So it was no longer just saying, oh, isn't that kooky? How do they think up those funny things? It was sort of extraordinary how history Must have in some been. way... Well, so history it was some way, sort of life imitating art. Well, it was wonderful. Yes. I'm, you know, I mean, it was, one says that. Do people often say that you're clairvoyant in your plays? All you're... the time. No, <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, absolutely. No, I mean that you're looking ahead... Uh, and that, how did you know that this was going to happen? All the time, Ed. Ask me anything. I'll, sh I'll sell you a <laughs> no, play and no, you can see what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> but haven't you had experiences in, in addition to this one about the... Eerie, eerie. I've, really? I've frightened myself sometimes really? with the clarity. 
<laughs> East, Eastern Europe, I saw that. China, I saw, I saw that. that, yes. Let me ask you, uh, speaking about the composition of House of Blue Leaves, yeah. I believe I've heard you say that you had finished the first act, yeah. hadn't quite gotten a handle on the second act. No, I had no. And you were in, it was, it, is that when you were in England and you saw... Uh, I remember you... you I already had seen it. No, no, I already had seen those before I wrote you it. Saw, you but it. I let, we, are, we should back up and say you saw on two successive nights... I saw the, the Dance de of Death and Flea in Her Ear right. with, 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 uh, uh, with uh, Olivier in both. And it was both was so remarkable that when I saw one, it bled into the other, and it seemed to be like one play. And I said, well, God, one, one is this heavy Strindberg play, and the other is this very light Fado farce. Well, not, neither are light. Both are demonic. No, yeah. no, no. One is not heavy, and one is not light. Both are demonic. But in quite different ways. No. <laughs> They're right. both about torture. All right. Oh, Except no, one that... is a bedroom farce and one is a Strindbergian. Uh, I won't use And which is again. which? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and uh, I... Well, what influence did that have on writing The House of Blue Leaves, or if it did? Well, I would just that a play can be anything you want it to be. I mean, why does it have to be... If I love that and I love that, why can't it be... The same, why can't the same, why can't one's aspirations be? Why can't my White Want song, the second song in the, the record album of my life, why can't, why can't, if, if I'd love, at that point, The Homecoming, which I'd just seen, and Gypsy, which had been my favorite musical, why can't, if you love those, why can't they work together? Why can't you have a serious play with songs in it? Why can't you have the emotional needs of A Dance of Death into a, in a farce, because the people need so much in a flea in her ear. Why can't, how, how much baggage can a flea in her ear take? Well, several, it seems to me several of your plays were strongly influenced by that notion that you're just describing now. Landscape of the Body, Marco Polo Sings a Solo. There was a whole group of plays, Bosoms and Neglect, uh -huh. all have this juxtaposition, it seems to me, of the sort of screamingly funny and the extremely serious, right all together there. Is that a... I'll take that out, if you say so, Ed. <laughs> no, but I'll I mean, take it out. No, isn't that true? Don't I you? hope so, sure. I mean, you want to play... You go there. It's a play. It's something that you go to have a wonderful time at. You know, you've got to have a lot... I'd like to have but a also, lot going on but also in the play. There, you also have a serious side to these... Uh, many of these plays. Yes. I mean, you don't take that as an unfair accusation or anything, do you? Uh, if the I say act that, of writing is serious. I've just been reading... P.G. Woodhouse plays, Good Morning Bill. I mean, it's, I'm amazed at the seriousness with which he addresses the issues of Lord Tidmouth. Well, you, but, and you say that Fado, who's known by most people as this boulevard farceur, is, is serious as far as you can Because those people's needs are serious. He doesn't make fun of the people. Those people's needs are desperate. Let me ask you, changing the subject now slightly, because after writing a whole series of plays like House of Blue Leaves and Landscape of the Body uh -huh. and Bosoms and Neglect and Marco Polo Sings a Solo, you began writing a series of historical plays, which, of which I think so far three have been completed. I just handed in, again, I had a big week last week, I just <laughs> handed in the galleys for, for uh, Women in Water, which will be published uh, by Dramatist Play Service in a couple of months. Well, what we, we should say that, these, that the three plays are Lydie Breeze, Gardenia, and Women in Water. Yeah. And that they happen, they were written, I think, in that order. Yes. Lydie Breeze, Gardenia, yeah. and Women in Water. But the chronology inside the plays is just the reverse. I just, like the ring cycle, he wrote them. <laughs> Wagner wrote the ring cycle backwards, too. The librettos backwards. Right. So I'm, oh, yes. You're right uh, Absolutely. on target. Absolutely, that's the, right. The uh, uh, Women in Water takes place in the Civil War. Yeah. And then this group of people who emerge from the Civil War go to Nantucket to found, found uh, an idyllic Eden, yeah. uh, utopia, which you call... Aipa to. Aipa to. Utopia which, backwards. backwards. Which they founded. Lottie Breeze and... Uh, Joshua uh, Hickman and Dan Grady and Amos, Amos Mason. Her, and uh, this, these really, basically, these four people. Yeah. And then during the course of the... Because in Gardenia, they go from about 1875 to... 1884. It, that's right, absolutely. And, and then the final one so far, is 1895. 1895. Yeah. Uh, are, is there going to be a fourth yes, one? Yes, there is, but it's between Gardenia and Lighty Breeze. Why, how and why did you decide to turn to history after 
writing so many New York plays, so well, many exactly, urban plays. Well, for exactly the reason that you, that you say, I felt that living in New York City, I felt that uh, one was getting, I felt there was a pool that a lot of people were, were, were dipping into. And I wanted, I wanted something that belonged only to me. I wanted a world that, I also felt that I loved 19th century novels. I mean, I love, simple as that, I love to read 19th century novels. And I said, God, wouldn't it be great to try that? If, I mean, the more, the more, if you love something, as I talked before about liking musicals and, you know, those two plays, those two styles and trying to put them together, that if you like something, it's so easy to say, oh, I hate that, get rid of that, oh, I just don't want that, we get it out of it ourselves. But when you say, gee, I really like that, I really love that, or that moves me, our obligation is to say, how do I translate that then into my own terms? And I love long 19th century novels, and I wanted to try something, I wanted to take away everything that I, I, I knew in my slender fashion how to, to do. I wanted to remove language, I wanted to remove the glibness of 19th of 20th century speech. I wanted to find a new structure. I loved the structures, the structural devices and strategies that were available to 19th century novelists that because of the plotting of our fragmented lives is not accessible. I wanted to try to find a new way to demonstrate people's lives. I wanted to write a series of plays that would be all in different styles, that would not, there would be a bunch of plays, but I mean I didn't, this all happened not this consciously, except it sort of did happen that consciously. Uh, How did you happen to pick Nantucket? Ed? Well, because I, at a grim time in my life, when I didn't know quite where I was, what I was doing with my life, uh, I went up to Nantucket and I stayed there for well, several weeks, months, whatever. No, I mean off and on for right. a long time, for right. a few years. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. And I was back in. I mean, it was just a place for a few years where I. Spend was yeah. yes, and uh, and that my both my parents had been from New England, and there had been a lot of things that you'd always hear in the background, you know, stories and things that were un inaccessible. And suddenly, being at Nantucket, I found that as some kind of magnet that allowed me to reinvent or try to decipher the things that I had heard. My 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 great grandfather, indeed, was a fishing captain named oh, really? Joshua Hickman. I mean, and these are all, there were stories who had been in so there's, there's the Civil a... War, and there, there had, and I kept, there were things that, these, you know, these slivers of conversation, these, uh, the, the bulk of my, of my parents and my relatives were born in the last century, were born in the 19th century, and so, I mean, it's... Thematically, one of the things that uh, it seems interesting to me is that in the last play, uh, Lady Breeze, it really is about a dream gone wrong. This uh, Eden, this yeah. uh, Aupatu, uh, utopia, yeah. did not work out because through various kinds of unintentional, perhaps, betrayals and what have you of these people. Uh, and it, intentional. And yeah. intentional, both. Yeah. Uh, it failed. Yeah. And uh, oddly enough, uh, I think in terms of... Uh, optimism in f as far as this country is concerned. Interesting, you, you picked the 19th century about a dream gone wrong, but this country was very optimistic in the early part of this century and uh, through the middle part of this century. Wouldn't you say in terms of America? No, I mean... There was you don't a, think so? No, I mean because, no, you just read our own literature and you know that... I I'm mean, thinking about the optimism uh, after World War II and after, after the Second World War when we really felt we could save the world. and. Uh, but I'm not writing about that period. Well, I, I understand that. What I'm really saying, though, is here you are writing in the 19th century uh, when there was still a sense of expansiveness and of being able to uh, onward and upward. Uh, and really, in a way, you're making a comment not only about then but about now, I think, in these historical plays. Well, I mean, the novels that, you know, that you, I mean, that you, one loves are, I mean, uh, Herman Melville. And, I mean, Pierre is probably the most depressing novel I've ever read. And... Sister Carrie in American Tragedy, and uh, and I mean that image of the shattered golden bowl. I mean that's, I mean that's. Um, so you find you find one kind of 
dream gone wrong in the historical plays and perhaps another kind uh, in a play like Landscape of the Body. That's or, right, because it's, a, it's not so much a, it's not so much as a dream gone wrong, it's just sort of a, a contract that the, that the trusting citizens <laughs> had, viola had violated. John, we don't have much time left. I would like to have your thoughts just about the state of the theater right now, which is what you've given well, your life to, well, in I'll terms of you. the live theater here in the United States. I mean, I couldn't be, I've got a new play. We, I can't wait. We, what am I, I, I'll tell you something. If I didn't have a, a play about to go into rehearsal, I would say it's in a terrible state. It's in a terrible state, Ed. But gosh, I mean, I'm in that tremendously happy time right now. I don't know what will happen to the play. We're opening in Lincoln Center in the late winter, March or April, mm -hmm. and it's called Six Degrees of Separation, and Jerry Zachs, Zachs. will be directing it. Who, who directed uh, House the House of Blue Leaves Blue. and Lincoln Center, and uh, Gregory Mosh is producing, and uh, Tony Walton's designing, and we're in auditions right now, and so, so that's a great time. time. Sure, so you ask me what state the theater in is, you say, boy, there's a theater where I'm working in it, and I'm, there's an, an, a newspaper. I'm really blessed right now. I mean, there's a, a, I'm the editor, the co-editor of the Lincoln Center New Theater Review, and so I have a way to put one's feelings about the theater and into some kind of forum. We have some, you know, there's a pl I belong to a theater. I mean, I hope that lasts. So you personally don't share the pessimism that you hear on some fronts from playwrights about not being able to get their work done or not enough no, new Listen, work I in. wrote a play with 35 people and I've had two productions, Moon Over Miami, and I'm still working on it. We did it at Yale. I did another play, Women in Water. Uh, I, uh, we did, we've done it on the BBC and we've done it, at, uh, an earlier version of the arena, and then we did it uh, s s um, the summer before last, the Atlantic Theatre Company did it at Montpelier. For various reasons, I didn't want it to come into New York, but one day... It will. I will, because yes. I'm just my work is being done on it. I feel that the theater has never been an easy place, and uh, I feel the level of playwriting right now is sort of extraordinary. I mean, the amount of people who are writing for the theater. I've just been teaching at City College, and the, the students in the class were wonderful. Uh, being at Yale last spring, working on my play, the students were, simple as this, wonderful. There are young new playwrights that, uh, like Robbie Bates, play called the Film Society, say, gee, I never knew that was what it would be like if I lived in South Africa. Uh, I mean, they're just wonderful. So, I mean, the state of the theater, it's always over. I think economically, I think it's, you know, I mean, I think that's, that's one other subject that I don't want to get right, into. But right. it seems to me that in spite of all that, that the theater is a place that's constantly reinventing itself. John, on that very optimistic uh, note, we have to end, I'm sorry to say, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Ed. This has been Spotlight, and my guest has been playwright John Guare. Thank you for being with us. The preceding program was made possible in part by a generous grant from the Educational Foundation of America.